Hello world, I'm your host Max Patton, and this is Dreaming Polygons, the podcast where we explore the games industry and where it's headed by interviewing the voices and perspectives shaping its future, one polygon at a time. Today our guest is Mariana Graham, also known online as Raspberry Fox, 3D modeler and artist at Pluckett, working on the farming and building game Staxel, as well as a former modeler and animator at Mojang, the makers of Minecraft. Let's see what she has to say about what it's like doing 3D art and hear her personal story but how she got into games to begin with, and her advice for others. Hello. Hey. Hi. So uh, first, let's start with your story. At what moment did you decide that you wanted to be an artist, and what was the moment that made that apparent for games? So I've always been a pretty artsy person. When I finished high school, uh, I used to draw a lot and stuff, but I went more for the music route, and I studied music for 12 years. And then after that, I was kind of tired of having to go like on the road and go to shows and not spend time with my family and just like weekends were not a thing. Uh, It was long nights uh, and you started super early in the day. So I saw all my friends going out and having fun and I had so much responsibility with music. Uh, I decided I wanted to try something new. So I started, uh, well, I went to college again university and I studied industrial design which is very art centric branch of 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 it's kind of like architecture but in like small Mm -hmm. so like anything that's like furniture or cars or electronics or all that kind of stuff is uh, industrial design when I was in university though it had some technical aspects because it was kind of like it's also kind of an engineering thing Uh, We also did a lot of art, so I would constantly be drawing. I took like all nine semesters, I had to take art. And like since like from drawing on paper all the way to like computer and digital art too. Um, So we learned the basic first on paper and then we moved into digital art. When I started to use 3D modeling software, I fell in love. It was like my favorite thing to do. I started with 3D Max, uh, another software called SolidWorks, and one called Unigraphics, which is more for engineering. And they use it, uh, General Motors uses it for designing their cars. Uh, And after that, I just kept going. Um, I finished school, but like right the last two or three semesters of university, I discovered Minecraft. And... I loved playing like playing the game and like building stuff and then as as I've said before I wanted to be able to decorate so I started making models and after like four years or five years of making stuff I had suddenly generated a portfolio that caught the attention of game studios when I was at Minecon in London and for those who don't know, that's like a convention centered around Minecraft. Yeah, um, they have this on the convention floor. They had a section for indie games and, de- and developers. Well, you start to mingle with all these kinds of people. And it was interesting because they already knew who I was. We, we had gone to like a bar afterwards just to talk and stuff. We started talking about their new game and everything. And it still took about six months until... Uh, Bart from Pluckett, who are the creators of Staxel, uh, contacted me through the other artist, Connor, as well. We'd kept in touch. That's how I started moving into the game industry. And so just rewinding back a bit, was Minecraft like your first game that you got into? No, um, I've been gaming since I can remember. Um, I think my first gaming console, I used to play on my parents' Atari. So I was really young. And then my dad bought me a Sega Genesis. It's a 16-bit console uh, from the 90s. And I was six years old, and I had my first console. Before that, I played on also floppy disks, like huge floppy disks on my dad's IBM when people didn't even have computers. My dad had a computer because of his job. He had a computer at home. And I started playing games on floppy disks on his computer. Then he got me the, the console. And then from there, it's like history. I I guess I started gaming even before I was six years old. 
So you've always loved gaming, but it was when you realized you could apply 3D modeling to it that you realized it's a field you could be in. Yeah, it's really strange. I never even thought of gaming as, oh my gosh, I want to be a game developer. It never even crossed my mind. It was complete coincidence. Like I started studying design and I thought, oh, I'll just make furniture or whatever. Like for companies like Ikea or something. And suddenly I stumbled onto Minecraft and I realized there's this whole world. And even while I was making mods, I didn't realize game development was a thing yet. Like it hadn't, it didn't hit me until later. It's interesting because a lot of people who start out, you know, making mods for either Minecraft or Skyrim, you know, whatever game, they're making a mod, but they don't realize that they're actually kind of doing the work of a developer when they're doing that. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's really strange. You don't really put two and two together. Well, I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> Your experience at Pluckit, you explained how you started there. What are you doing on Staxel or what have you been doing for the past few years? Because it's been developed for a while. What has that been like? I joined Staxel two years after. And when I started, all I did was make models, which is my favorite thing. I, st I had to learn a new software. I'd never, ever used Cubicle, which was what we were using. Um, I basically jumped right in. I looked up tutorials trying to figure out this 3D software. And then I just started making, first off, I started making furniture. Because that was my thing, right? DecoCraft, and that's how they got to know me. And they're like, oh, we need furniture for the game. Can you help us? Uh, because uh, Connor, the other artist, has a lot on his plate. And I said, sure. So I started designing a bunch of different furniture sets for Staxel. And after that, it was more of a, we need some help making crops. I had never struggled more than when I'm making organic things. Like, plants are hard. <laughs> Yeah. And each crop had like 24 growth stages or something. Jeez. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't even know how many crops are in Staxel and trees and berry bushes and everything. So the other artist had made a couple um, and I just looked at his stuff and I tried to emulate like positioning and everything. And I started making all the growth stages for the crops. And after crops, it was like, oh, so we need to, we have some really old blocks that need like a, a do-over because they're like completely a different style. Um, so again, I started working on also furniture, but simultaneously started fixing like bugs, graphical bugs in the blocks. That was, I think, the least fun work, having to redo stuff that already is there that isn't really your work and you didn't really do and you have to figure out the style to make everything match someone else's vision. Yeah, I wanted to ask that because you make it sound easy, but obviously, you know, making stuff for a Minecraft mod to fit in Minecraft style is probably different from what you were doing now, which is, you know, making stuff for a voxel game. So it's similar, but I'm sure there were differences in the art style. You just have to learn to observe. Um, I'm sure, like, this is probably the case for a lot of game companies. You have a, a lead artist or an artist that's already there and that person already has a style and a vision and everything for the game but getting like every person has their own style and their own way of seeing things and their own color preferences and everything as an artist when you're working in a team you have to sit down and talk to each other and kind of decide like say we have a color palette for the game um how many colors are allowed per color in a voxel game or a pixel art game, that's super important. Like, do you have five shades? Do you have eight shades? Do you have 12 shades? Like, how many shades of each color are you allowed to use? Um, and from there also, what's the difference uh, from one shade to the next? Like, how different is, like, the light one from the next one to all the way to the darkest one? So that everything matches, like, the degrees of darkness, of saturation, of everything. And then also trying to observe stuff that isn't really palpable, like how a certain person does their shading and stuff. So you have to mimic it so that everyone, everyone's art looks like it was made by the same person, even if it's a big team. You're describing this, and I'm realizing it sounds almost mathematical. Yeah, you might say that. Uh, there's Thankfully, there's palette generators. You input stuff. You say, this is my starting color and this is my final color. Please calculate all the colors in between. So you can actually do that. You can uh, pick one, uh, I don't know, 10 different colors, and it'll give you the palette 
the complete palette up to the point you want it for each of those colors. So a lot of it, you don't even have to do it. There's so many tools and a lot of them are free and you can find them online, uh, like palette generators for pixel art and you'll find a bunch. You can tell it how many colors you want and, and everything. So you just pick one color and it makes all the derivations. Yeah, I mean, color is something, it's one of those things that seems simple, but like I follow a lot of game developers on Twitter and I hear conversations like, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing when I'm designing a palette for my game because there's a lot of people who are just mainly programmers, right? And they're making their own games. And I heard one guy said he just copied the NES palette, which, you know, fair enough, because some people just, it's kind of intimidating to do stuff like that, which I guess is good that you are working in a team of multiple people and, you know, yet experience, obviously, working with things like that. I think uh, my studies in university for industrial design were super important because we did take like a whole semester of this class that's called color theory. All you do is learn about color theory. What colors give you what sensations, what like everything from like sen sensory like feelings and everything to what colors fit together and why. I think that formation really, really helped me because I don't consider myself a self-taught artist anymore because I did study for a long time, not art. I, like I'm not an art major, but my degree revolved 100% around drawing and art and like graphical representation of something that in the future would be a real object, right? But right. you have to start somewhere and that somewhere mm -hmm. is drawing it. Yeah, because a lot of design is not just the act of making stuff, but it's planning it out and planning out how it's going to work and, you know, like what colors you're going to need, all of that stuff. People take it for granted when they're playing a game like, oh, this is simplistic voxel 3D graphics, but it still takes a lot of work, I imagine. Yeah, um, I remember one instance where Connor and I sat down and we basically were like, Okay, so, well, actually, it was because I was complaining at him <laughs> because he had made the, the, like, the NPC model and all the animations. Like, he's amazing. But then he had also made some furniture because they didn't have any furniture for the game, and he had made some basic little pieces of furniture. But the furniture looked way too small for the characters, like, like it was toy furniture compared to their size. And... Connor's a brilliant artist, but he does not have the same formation that I do. When I studied industrial design, you learn uh, biomechanics and, and um, proportion. And his human models were perfectly proportionate, but the furniture he made for said humans that were going to use it, or in this case, Staxelians or whatever you want to call them, they didn't fit the measurements of the Staxel people. So I actually sat down for like, we must have spent an hour just talking and taking measurements and me trying to make a whole document, a design document for every piece of furniture in the game, what the measurements were. And I'm not just talking width and height and depth. Uh, I'm talking if it's a chair, at what height do the knees bend so that you can sit and, and your feet are still touching the ground? Um, how high do the armrests have to be? How high does the back of the chair have to be? How large does the bed have to be um, so that, like, when you're lying down, your feet don't stick out? Or if you turn around and you're sitting on the edge of the bed, the feet are actually hanging from the edge because you're already in a bed. Or, like, you have to take into consideration all of the animations we had with the furniture and how they were going to work. Um, so we have this huge document where it's like, if it's a double seater, what's the space between one seat and the other? And where's the center? And like a bunch of stuff that's like really strange that you don't really think about. But it had to be done because it didn't look correct in the beginning. As we strive to make games more immersive, I guess it's important, you know, to have people like you who come from different backgrounds because a lot of this stuff is just taken for granted and it ends up looking kind of weird if you're a player or if you notice these things because a lot of people do. Yeah, I guess. And I mean, you look at Staxel and yeah, it's voxels, but it still needed to look right. Right. And Staxel's launched recently on uh, Early Access on Steam, which is a big deal because previously the game was kind of a Early Access preview on its own thing. But now it's on Steam. It's a much bigger audience. You've opened the floodgates. As someone working on that game, what is that like? It's nerve wracking. Like the first few hours of release, you're like, 
biting your nails. Oh my gosh, are people going to like it? Right. Um, is the whole all the work we've put in for four years uh, for not? No, you know, like games, like they crash and burn all the time. Mm -hmm. And like they, they say, you only get one launch because even if it's an early access launch, people are still going to make a big deal of, of it because it's Steam. Yeah, totally. And we were actually kind of scared of, of releasing in early access because a lot of other less ethical indie game companies and triple A's will yeah. release a game on early access and then basically uh, run off with the money and never update. <laughs> and <laughs> Well, we live in the world where games like Battlefield come out and like, you know, the shooting doesn't work or something, right? Yeah, that's that's I think that's shameful for a AAA game. The fact that they have so many bugs because they yeah. have so much more money to fix that stuff. And I don't know what corporations are thinking most of the time in, in that respect. I know a lot of indies pour their heart and souls into their games. And I know some indies who are like, let's build a game in Unity with assets that we bought and release it and say it's super awesome but it's really shit. and then they never ever update the game and they get all these bad reviews and people complaining and people can't get their money back and they never touch the game again especially when early access began you could see that a lot i think a lot of devs are more careful nowadays right because all of those other devs gave such a bad name to early access that's also why we were so scared of releasing Axel on early access mm -hmm. because we didn't want to be considered like one of those companies that makes a really bad game and then doesn't fix it yeah it's scary i mean it's a, and it's a dangerous present like you mentioned with early access everything all the expectations it makes you understand why some people will just release a game out of the blue on steam all finished and stuff and for the most respects i mean staxel is a pretty polished game it's not like it's pretty far from you know most early access games it could almost be like a release so i guess it's kind of unique in that respect that was that was our thinking going in we really wanted to release as a full game but in we couldn't really in good conscience say it's a perfectly finished game because it's not so we're act actively talking to the community all the time we have a discord we have the steam discussions we have forums we pay close attention to our twitter and direct messages and everything and there's always going to be someone awake thankfully the team is from all over the world we have people in australia we have people in europe we have people in the u.s mm -hmm. um there's always someone there to answer and we're trying to fix as much that people have found that they don't like or all the feedback we think that is credible that we can fix mm -hmm. we're we're like putting the pedal to the metal to try and fix it as fast as possible. Right. Um, yeah. And rewinding a bit to Mojang, which is what you also were doing a few months ago, in addition to your Staxel work, you were working on the Minecraft marketplace, right? Right now I'm working on the Minecraft marketplace. I had to leave Mojang to work on the marketplace. So I'm still making content, my own stuff. I make skin packs and maps and texture pack that's about to come out as well. That's kind of like mini game dev because like every map you release is uh, like a miniature game inside of Minecraft, I guess. I've heard this analogy made a lot of times when talking to, you know, people who make Minecraft mods that Minecraft is kind of like a game engine in itself. A lot of people do like using Minecraft as an engine. Uh, I've seen projects uh, work and I've seen other projects just be like in the wind, like, oh, I'm going to use Minecraft as a as the engine and I'm going to remove the like the start screen and I'm going to do a bunch of stuff and um, they use it to make brand new games. Uh, and they're uh, crazy. The, yeah, and it's kind of crazy and some of them never work and some yeah. of them work really, really, really well. Like I think it was better than Wolves. It was like a complete Minecraft overhaul if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Yeah. And someone like rebuilt Portal using a texture pack and like a map. Yeah. So yeah, there, oh yeah, of course, there's always going to be the, the people copying games that are super popular mm -hmm. and turning them into a mod, yeah. um, like the Pokemon ones, and then Nintendo DMCAs. <laughs> yeah, that's awkward. And they have to take the mod down because, yeah, in the end, it's not their IP. And even if they're not making money, Nintendo can be touchy. So yeah, I guess there's that. Marketplace isn't as complex. For starters, it's on a version of Minecraft that's called Bedrock 
which is still very far from being as well developed as Java version of Minecraft. Mm -hmm. It's years away. They're trying, they're closing the gap pretty fast, but they're still like, it's going to take a while for them to be able to reach the level of the Java edition. But in some, in some terms, I've heard it's kind of better because it's obviously, you know, bedrock, the name of it, it's built on a new foundation. It, it runs smoother, you know, all of those benefits you get from rewriting a game. It, it definitely feels different. I've noticed that. It does just feel different. It, yeah. The rendering is farther away. Um, it's built on a completely different uh, language, but it's not as versatile. It's nowhere near having an API like the one we have for Java, which is Forge. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of unofficial for Java too. It is. It is unofficial, but it's official. It's as official as it's probably going to get. And as I've been working with the Bedrock Edition, I've obviously um, found some some things that are really cool. But developing, you can't develop mods. You can make an add-on. Yeah, and you're right that it's like limited. Obviously, like with AI and the textures and everything, you can't do the same things you can do in Java Minecraft. But at the same time, I think what Microsoft Mojang, you know, whatever you want to call it, has done a good job doing with the new version that it's on everything, right? Like Xbox and iPhones, is that it's really accessible, like for people to make maps, to make content, and to use it. Whereas kind of before on the Java version. It was um, kind of a pain getting mods running, especially for you know young kids, a lot of who play Minecraft who might not be the most technologically savvy. Oh yeah, definitely. Add-ons, if you're making them, it's probably equally difficult to having to run plugins. Uh, it's not as installing them. Someone else made them and installing them using like Windows 10, which is the version which would be the easiest because you can access your folders in your computer. Right. If you're on your Xbox, you're out of luck. You cannot download any add-ons. But don't you have the marketplace where you can kind of get pre-approved content from yes, that? Yes, that's, yeah. that's, that's the cool part about Marketplace is you can get like skins without having to like open, like try and install them on your console, which is never going to happen. Yeah. You can have maps and you can have texture packs and everything. The only difference is you, if say someone on the internet makes an add-on, you can't exactly download it onto your Xbox. We're not allowed to sell add-ons on the marketplace. So say someone made a bunch of, changed all of the Minecraft creatures into like jungle creatures, like lions and tigers and a giraffe and blah, 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 blah. Uh, you can't add that to your game unless it's included with a map. Mm -hmm. So you can only access them via a map that already exists. Add-ons are not a thing for marketplace and they will probably never be a thing for marketplace. Um, you will get a map that's an experience that includes an add-on, but you cannot use that add-on outside of that map. Right. So it's kind of limited to these little bubbles of content. Exactly. Yeah, it's definitely different. A lot of these, you know, like on the Java version, while it is amazing what you can do, um, it's kind of scary what I've seen that, you know, kids can download from forums just unapproved stuff. Not viruses. Safe for viruses, yeah. yeah, all sorts of bad stuff. Whereas the marketplace kind of solves that. Going at a macro level, like uh, way more broad scale uh, in the games industry, you know, you come from this background of design, right? And gaming, it's a male dominated industry. I mean, there's all these factors that make your story kind of unique. What advice would you give to people who are outsiders who are looking to enter the games industry? In the beginning, unless you're super lucky, don't expect to make a lot of money or any money. I'm serious. I worked for five years and I didn't make a cent. Jeez. Indie game industry. Rarely, rarely will an employer offer you a salary. You're going to have to get another job that probably has nothing to do with the industry so that you can eat, so that you can pursue your passion, so that you can make a portfolio, so that you can have experience publishing a game so that any company will even look at you. They are interested in what you can do. They're not interested in if you studied game development. It's important. You have the basis, like in industrial design, I had all my bases with the, the art and design and math 
and all of that stuff, 3D modeling. And I had perfect grades. Like I graduated top of my university, not even top of my class. Wow. No one would hire me because they don't care. They want to know what you can do. So the first, if you're in school, from when you start school, start making a portfolio. Even if your stuff is horrible, it doesn't matter. So that they can also see your evolution. How fast can you learn? What have you done? Because everyone wants to be a game developer nowadays. There are so many kids who are like, want to be a game developer. Game developers are the new rock stars. Everyone wants to be one. And a portfolio is super, super important. Way more important than your diploma. If you have a diploma, that's all extra brownie points. But the portfolio is like the centerpiece of everything. Work hard. Yes, you're going to have to do stuff you don't like. But on the side, when you have time, do what you like and keep records of everything. Yeah, basically that. Usually, most people start in an indie studio. Indie studios are, have their own charm about them. You're not in this big corporate thing where you have tons of rules and they're checking when you're coming in and leaving work. Mm -hmm. Indie game industry is pretty lax in hours you work. Uh, I mean, you work a lot of hours, but you can decide to pull an all-nighter and sleep during the day if that's your thing. You don't have a schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, I don't know, crunch a few days if you wanted to take a few other days off. Um, you can organize your time how you see fit. Like really small indies, like in my case. Uh, when I joined Mojang, Mojang really wasn't an indie anymore. And I actually had a schedule and I had to go to work at a certain time and leave work at a certain time and everything, right? Right. Um, in the beginning, as I said, indies are probably not going to pay you a salary. They're going to tell you, okay, so we're making a game. We like you. We have no money. We're all poor. We're all working second jobs and making this game in our free time. Do you want to help us? You have to say, okay, yeah, sure, or no, I want a paid job, and then you can keep trying, and maybe you'll find a company that will pay you, but most likely you're going to have to work for free for a while. And it's not free. It's work until the game gets released, and then you get all the cash all at once. Because when you release a game, that's when you get paid. Mm -hmm. A lot of people might not like that. Well, it's honest. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's I mean that was my experience and that's the experience of a lot of people I know. Mm -hmm. If you want to do this while you make a name for yourself, it's going to be super rough. Uh, I don't want to like I don't want to sugarcoat it. Some people are super lucky. Like it also has to do a lot with who you know. Some kids get hired straight out of school because they made a really cool project and maybe Blizzard noticed them. I know of a case of a kid who made some really cool floating cars, like the ones that are in Overwatch. Hmm. Blizzard saw his portfolio and they're like, as soon as you graduate, we're hiring you. Wow. Same for, I think, Bethesda. I've heard of cases of kids who are modders or young people who are modders. And I don't want to say kids, but like I, rem I remember when I was like fresh out of university and I thought I was still a kid. So sorry, I don't want to offend anyone with the kid thing. Uh, young adults yeah. who want to... Uh, who started making mods and they made this amazing mod so much that the mod caught the attention of media or whatever and boom, they are hired at a triple A studio right off the bat. Those cases, it's like it's like the supermodel that got discovered in, a, in Brazil in a small town and she's the farmer's daughter, you know? Yeah. Like that doesn't happen. It's rare, it's yeah. It's like one in a million or in a billion. <laughs> I don't even know. Um, they usually go for people who've been grinding all the way from the bottom for years. But yeah, I can't stress it enough. Portfolio. Your portfolio is the most important thing. If you're a coder, it doesn't matter. Your coding portfolio it doesn't have to look pretty. It has to work. Same for artists. And as a, as, a, as a woman in the industry, as you were asking, I really never considered my gender as something that would stop me or or that would like it never even crossed my mind that my gender was a thing it's just like game design didn't cross my mind that it was a thing like i didn't know game development was a thing and right. i stumbled onto it 
I never considered my gender as uh, something that defined me. It never mm-hmm. even popped into my head that women have it hard or have it easy in in the industry. It's more like, oh, I stumbled into the industry and this is what I want to do and I like it and I'm going to do it. It was never a matter of how has being a woman in the industry affected you or how hard has it been or how easy has it been. When I started working at Mojang, like the week after I started at Mojang, there was a few people from Microsoft came to visit the Mojang offices like they normally do every month or so. They have people from Microsoft over or they go over to Microsoft in Redmond. And there was this uh, woman and we were going out to lunch and I was like just hanging about because I was the new kid. And she turns to me as we're walking down the street and she's like, so what does it feel like being a woman working at Mojang? Mm -hmm. And I just stopped and I looked at her and I said, I don't know, the same as being a man, but I have boobs. (laughs) That's literally like what I said. And I said, I I have no idea what you want me to answer. Like, Mm -hmm. what do you want me to say? Uh, I hope I, and then it it hit me. And then I went and I talked to the person who hired me, who also happens to be a woman, Mm -hmm. which again, I didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind. And I told her, so this happened. And this person asked me what it felt like being a woman in Mojang. and. I'm now worried, I told her straight up, that did you hire me just because I was a woman? Were you looking for women? Why is this an important question? Was I hired because of what I can do because I was something that you wanted and you liked what, I, what you saw? Or was it because what? Like, what, what, what is the reason? Why did she ask me this? And so I think mostly after that happened, it's more of, uh, and then reading about all the stuff that you see, right? Mm. Uh, in, on Twitter and on games, magazines, online articles and stuff about right. women in gaming. And I've never felt a hostile environment towards me. I've never felt like I was singled out, except for that time I was asked what it felt like being a woman huh. in the game industry at like my second week in like, or first week. First or second week I had started working there. And then I started doubting my abilities. So you think being asked that is what made you feel isolated the most or scared the most that it was just that it was that made you think about that as diversity instead of just talent. I had never really even thought about it like that. That's so yeah, definitely. The instant I got asked, it was like, wait, like, what is going on? Is it? Is, is it my work? Like, do you like my work? Or is my work just good enough that you were able to hire me instead of someone else? Not because I was better, but because I was a girl and I was eh, good enough. And that's when I started to doubt. Like, at that point, it was like, am I, am I really good enough? And I never felt this. Like, when I got hired at Pluck It, all of the others are guys. Right. All the other developers for Staxel are, are guys. Uh, not that that made any difference to me. It's more of a, yeah, I'm kind of used to the fact that there aren't many women that even like video games. Like all of my friends back home in Mexico, at least, this is how it is in my country. Mm-hmm. None of my girlfriends were interested in video games. I would invite them over to my house. Hey, you want to play? No, I don't like it. Oh, hey, I, I did this. or I just stopped talking about it because none of my girlfriends were ever even remotely interested in games. Um, I'm not saying that it's like a fact of life that women don't like games. It's just that currently, I guess, less girls like games. But that's not really true because apparently like they've done some studies and it, it's like 50-50 almost. Yeah, I mean, the societal expectations are weird and it's different, obviously, right? Because I mean, it might be different for you and your industry. Um, I don't know, though, because I'm not in the games industry. But um, from what you said, you know, maybe in a field like programming, it is more harder if like um or from it coming from a different country it could be easier or harder like who knows yeah i I think that we have to study that more to be able to know exactly what the causes are for this even though as i said apparently a lot more women play games nowadays and none of my female friends in my age range i'm 85 1985 Mm -hmm. none of my friends none of them were interested in games 
my sister was, but I think it was our upbringing. My dad would buy us the games and we would play and and that was just the thing. Like we were introduced to games, so we liked games. I guess if you are not introduced to something, you won't really be interested in that, right? And I guess the whole games are for guys thing kind of probably affects that. Yeah, it's a cycle. I mean, like, you know, like a dad, like, oh, I have a daughter and a son, but I'll let the son play games so the daughter can do other things. And then you have people who are mostly guys making games for guys. And it's kind of like a cycle to perpetuate. Yeah, I think it's probably a perpetuatable cycle, definitely. Yeah. Um, but it's not, I, I, me, it's not something that I went through. And I might be the minority. Like, I never went through feeling like being a girl would stop me from anything. So I thank my dad for that. So when I see all these cases of women saying women aren't really pushed to STEM or pushed to game development or pushed to all of these things, to me, it's like completely alien because my dad never told me you can't do that because you're a girl. He didn't even bring up the fact that I was a girl, period. It's what do you want to do this? Okay. You want to take Taekwondo? Let's go take you to Taekwondo class. You want to play whatever? Sure, whatever. My dad never, ever said no because you're a girl. He didn't even say you're a girl, period. He said, you're my, you're like, you're my child and you can do whatever you want. And sure. So I guess my upbringing probably helped in the fact that to me, as I said, it's totally alien seeing how society is blamed for women not doing or not whatever. but it wasn't what my life experience has been. So I can't really identify with the whole thing. And as I said, the day I got asked, it totally freaked me out because I started second guessing myself. Mm -hmm. So you think it's more of a micro level of like just exposure? I think exposure has a lot to do with it. Um, I mean, of course, I had an aunt, for example who took her daughter to ballet and my cousin, all she did was ballet and tennis and all of these things that were seen as typically for girls or like gender neutral. Tennis is not really for girls, but it was not frowned upon. When we were in a traffic jam in the car one day, I turn around and I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to take karate. And she's like, you can't take karate. Like, no, karate is for boys you need to take ballet. And I'm like, I hate ballet. Like I took ballet a long time. Like my mom uh, took me to ballet and I didn't like it. And I took tap dancing, but I had to take ballet to take tap dancing. And I was like, nope, I hate ballet. So I'm not taking tap dancing either. And I got home and I told my mom. So my, my aunts told me that I can't take karate because it's not for girls. And like, I, I should take ballet, but I don't like ballet. And my mom's like, don't worry. And they took me like the next week I was all, I was signed up for Taekwondo lessons. Wow. So that's my parents. Those were my parents. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's different for everybody, but awesome hearing your story. And I think that's the longest answer we have to a question, but uh, it's, it's a good one. Uh, oh, thank sorry. you. <laughs> no, it's good. And we haven't had an episode in a while, so I can market this as a double feature. Um, anyhow, thank you for that so much. And again, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to find out about the work you do, follow you, where can they do that? Well, my Twitter is at Razzleberry Fox. My website where I have like a lot of my Minecraft content is www.razzleberry.es. So it would be Razzleberries. And we'll link that. So don't worry about catching it. Yeah, that's a weird spelling. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, that's practically where you can find me. Cool. Thank you again for coming on. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, guys. Bye. That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, feel free to rate us on Apple Podcast or leave a like on YouTube. You can subscribe to us in basically every podcast app and on YouTube as well. There is also Twitter, which you'll want to follow to stay updated on new episodes of the show. Follow that at, at @polygonsfm. Everything's going to be linked in the description, so don't worry if you didn't catch that. Thank you so much for listening to the end of our fourth episode, and I will see you with new guests next time. Until then, goodbye, world.